A media office is attacked. A beautiful soul hides under the table. She faces the wall. She would not give her attackers the satisfaction of seeing her in tears. She texts her parents, telling them they, she loves them. She survives the attack, but she walks out a different person. Some of us face major moments of trauma that they can trace. Others have minor moments of trauma happening around them every day, so close that we stop seeing it eventually. I was four when I saw the first dead bodies of the Civil War. I was six when a missile missed our house and killed six of our neighbors. I was 11 when a gun was pulled out on my father and he was taken away. When I try to trace back my trauma, all I see is a haze. And I've just realized that a few years back. And I wonder how many of us face the same dilemma and we fail to see it. And even when we do, our pride stops us from talking about it. As much as I want to be a motivational speaker here and give you something to be happy about, cheery about, walk out of here with your fists pumping, I am but only an academic and a poet at heart. So I'm going to try and work with your perspective today. Do you know what the highest turnout in recent history in the past two decades in elections were and where they happened? Surprisingly, it was Iraq, 2004, after the fall of the Saddam regime. Now, you would think that a country that hadn't had elections for more than two decades would not know how important elections were. On the other hand, the lowest turnout in recent history was the US presidential elections, where 50 odd percent people showed up. What's interesting is that both these elections share the same element that drives people showing up and not showing up. That's called othering, right? It's very difficult to know yourself, to identify yourself, to really put pen to paper and say who you are. But it's really easy to look down in your social structure and find the weakest link, find the smallest group, the emancipated group, and really point towards them and say, I am not them, right? So you define yourself in opposition to things. That is why in both elections, though one party in Iraq thought that if the others came into power, it would be an existential question for them. It was primal to their existence that they stay in power. On the other hand, in the United States, the others, the emancipated groups, thought that voting, voting wouldn't make a difference because their fates were decided. It's talking about labels, it's not just about politics. It's about something beyond that. Think about the racial jokes you crack everywhere around the world. Think of any country you've been to and think about their racial jokes. Mostly and very often, they would target the weaker in the group. You go to Iraq, the jokes are about the Kurds. You go to Pakistan, they used to joke about the Bengalis. In Afghanistan, at one point, we had the Indians coming in and working as cheap labor. Most of our jokes were about them. So that's the power of words and how they change our perspective. <clears throat> and it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that to our own identity as people of this country. And it has been happening throughout our lives. Ask your elders and they would tell you that Aristotle the Great brought the biggest army in the world and yet he was amazed at the fighting skill of the people of this land. You think about the Mongol hordes and how they faced tough battles through our region. The British Empire was expelled from this country, the Soviet Union, and so on and so forth. But there's something behind the scenes that we do not realize. Did we actually decide that this was our image, that this was who we were? Because I'll tell you, it wasn't us. So the British Empire actually invested a lot of energy and political will into creating this image of the Afghans as savage warriors. Rudyard Kipling, in his poem about his days in Afghanistan, writes about how if you were wounded and left on the plains of Afghanistan, and before the woman come out and cut what remains, roll 
towards your rifle and blow your brains and go to your guard like a soldier just to show you the savage nature of even the woman of Afghanistan. That helped the British Empire. That narrative was very important to them. It was important to them for two reasons. One was international law, rules of warfare, they only apply to humans. Humans that qualify and can be treated as equals. Whereas savages, really, counterinsurgency strategies can be whatever they are, and they're justified. Because they don't follow the rules, it's smart not to follow the rules with them. With justified punishments, like communal punishments, like community punishments that were happening in our region, do you understand that the British would demolish a whole marketplace if there was one security incident in that region? Against the primary basis of justice. And on the second end, why they did it was they needed local fighters. So they would go up to tribesmen, recruit them, give them money, and get them to fight against anyone who revolted. That's where the important narrative of savages fighting barbarians came into being. Because when you're sitting out there and you have people fighting amongst themselves, you really have nothing to lose. And I wish it ended there. Even the recent US intervention in Afghanistan, we see the term warlord being thrown around a lot. So those who allied by, by the US troops were considered tribal leaders, supporters of the cause, and anyone who opposed the United States, NATO, and its allies were considered warlords. And I heard a talk about how the Taliban were using terms better. They were using our own rhetoric and discourse against us. There's an interesting thought there. Because if you pick up their literature, if you look at the insurgency's material, one of the primary reasons they tell us to fight is because the pride of the Afghan has been injured. This land known as the graveyard of civilization, a stupid compliment that we wear as a badge on ourselves, keeps driving people from the villages to retake the honor of this country. Do we really want to have that image imposed on us? And then the idea is, I think it's human nature. So we can't really blame the Afghans or blame anyone else for how we think. We in human nature are conformists. We're so scared of standing out, we just want to merge into the crowd. And it comes from very, very primal instincts, like animals. Have you guys ever seen an elephant at a circus? I don't think we have circuses here, but if you go, do go to a circus by any chance, you'd see this huge elephant with a rope in its neck and it's tied to a peg on the ground, a peg that the elephant could literally remove with a sneeze. But the elephant never runs away. Why? Because the elephant, when it was a baby, it tried to resist the rope, eventually gave up. Now, even as a grown-up elephant, it thinks that the rope is unbreakable, so it never challenges it. And even in human psyche, there have been tests where people are brought into a room with seven other candidates who are all, who are all in on the act, and they're asked a question. And they all give the wrong answer. And the test subject is very often inclined to give the wrong answer. They know it's the wrong answer to give. But they don't want to stand out. They don't want to appear weird by giving the different answer. right? So conformity is within our nature. But then it creates problems, right? It creates problems where we stop questioning things around us. But we're lucky, because the past century or two, We've had scholars that have come up to question structures. The money you all have in your pocket, or whoever does have money here today, what does it mean? Why can you buy things with this currency? What happened to all the currencies before that? What if the government suddenly decides that we should start trading peanuts for our food or our clothes? What about the national anthem? What about the flag that we've changed so often in this country? What do they mean? Why do they have any meaning whatsoever? What if we all got up one day and decided that this money meant nothing? That's the power we have, because all these constructs around us only feed off whatever legitimacy we give it. And we have the power of stripping it away. 
That's where the very important quote by Barthes comes in. It's not just about what things are, it's about words. And he said, the time had arrived for the death of the writer and the birth of the reader. Texts were not dictated by those who wrote them. It was dictated by those who read them and how they perceived them. And that's a power we hold. And it's not just words, it's our perspective as a whole. It's about how we look at our suffering within this country. There's a very interesting book for those of us who are looking for some meaning in life, Man's Search for Meaning. It was written by a Nazi Holocaust camp survivor. He was a psychiatrist. And he writes about one of his patients, a husband who had recently lost his wife, the love of his life. He says he's lost all hope. He says that he's probably going to kill himself. So the doctor asks something really important. He asks him two questions. He says, is this pain unbearable? The answer obviously is yes. The second question he asks is, would you wish this unbearable pain of parting on your wife instead? Would you have had her, had her bury you instead? It's when the man realizes that there was some blessing in the suffering that he suffered. I don't know why I keep holding the paper upside down. Okay, and beyond that, something, an idea to wrap up things with. We've talked about our words, we've talked about our identities and how there's some incentive for an outsider to exploit it. One last thing that divides this country very often is the idea of what religion we believe in. <clears throat> Do you know that in Zoroastrianism, which was a religion propagated by Zarustra, which was the original religion of this land in Persia, it had one concept. The concept was to avoid druj, a word that still exists in our daily language, drug, in both Pashto and Dari. Beyond that, every religion you look at, the concepts are there still in our day-to-day -day languages. Buddha talked about avoiding dukkha, which ends up being the Hindi term for duk, which means suffering. So if we peeled religions to their core, we'd realize that at the end of it, there's just one message. It's to do good and not to do bad, to be better human beings. If there's one thing that we can take from religion, it's that at the core of it, it tries to unite us. So if you're going to walk out of here, and unless you decide that our words are important and how we use them, both in our jokes and in our thinking, unless you decide that you're going to accept the trauma and hurt that you have, unless you look at your neighbor and realize that they too are suffering a battle of their own, unless we find peace within, this country would never know peace. Thank you very much.